Good morning and welcome back to day two of TechFest. Thank you for joining us today for our first breakout session, The Science of Testing, presented by Thomas Haber of Red Green Refactor. If you have questions for Thomas, feel free to add them to the chat throughout the session and we'll address as we go along and again at the end during Q&A. Thomas, thanks for being here. The virtual stage is all yours. Thank you much, Allison, for the introduction. So welcome everyone this morning to The Science of Testing. I'll be your host, Thomas Haber. A little bit about myself. I work as a test automation architect, work for a number of Fortune 500 companies. Uh, but before I was in IT for around a decade, I worked as a research scientist. Uh, but that isn't actually my favorite job. My favorite job was when I spent about five years working as a baker. Uh, loved being able to make bread and compared to IT work, when you get to actually see your results every day or on a nightly basis, uh, you have a lot of great positive feedback there. I'm also an avid board gamer, as you can probably tell by the background behind me. So I own around 3,000 board games and they take up an entire room of my house and the overflow goes everywhere. I'm also an evangelist for Ruby Cucumber. It's the primary tool set I like to use for collaboration and practicing behavior-driven development. But let's just jump in. Today, we're going to learn about how science and testing are tethered together and how the rigors of science can help out with software testing. Uh, to do so, I'm gonna give you a little bit more about my background to learn sort of my place and how I went into IT, as well as breaking down some of the common conceptions and misconceptions about both testing as well as science with the scientific method and how we can help improve software testing with activities such as peer review, deduction and induction, exploratory testing, and hypothesis-driven development. So first, I have a question for everyone. You can feel free to post in the chat. I would like your feedback on how you can, how people consider testing in your workplace. So I'll give a minute or two for people to put their responses in. So we have needed, but time intensive, just starting it now. I'd like to say your responses are optional. If you're enjoying your breakfast and uh, enjoying a nice coffee, you can feel free to keep the hands off the keyboard. So we have another from Terry. Unit testing is part of our definition of done for user stories. A parallel checking process that shadows design and delivery. Eric, all the way from Australia, thanks for joining us. Kelly, everything goes through QA. Putting something out without testing is unheard of. And a, ne a necessity to ensure quality is delivered with each release. Anyone else want to weigh in? Let's say this as, an, as another baseline, how about science? So how do people view science and scientists compared to testers? Just this is your own experience of how you think, you know, scientists and what role they play in the world. Reminder, this is an op opinion-based answer, so you don't have to worry about being quote-unquote right or wrong. Jerome's super smart. Anyone else want to weigh in?
responsible for saving lives. So certainly in the last year and a half, a great deal of emphasis has been placed on medical science. For Taylor, uh, they test hypotheses and conduct investigations to learn new theories or information. So I would say one of the things that I have noted now, you know, spending about a decade in IT and before that a decade in science is that testing is seen as something that is important. However, it's often an activity at the end of the line uh, and therefore one that is prone to being cut down as we have deadlines that are set for our work. Uh, also found that folks in the software testing space are traditionally considered less valued, at least in terms of compensation than those as developers. Uh, we have Eric saying, experimenters to investigate, discover, and potentially pioneer new approaches or substances. As compared to science, you know, which is seen a, as a bit of an ivory tower, you know, spends most people in science who say in an academic world, uh, and it can be seen as a bit of a, a, a black box in terms of what they do. Of you know, you just potentially hear on the news, "Hey, a new study shows," and, and that's your like engagement with hearing science without necessarily thinking about all the ways in which you interact with the results of that knowledge gained. Similar to how we interact with the applications without necessarily thinking about all of the validation that went into that. So a little bit about my own personal journey. So I went through three different uh, research institutions collecting uh, pieces of paper that said, you know, I'm smart along the way, but also collecting a massive amount of student loan debt. Uh, eventually my friends convinced me that, you know, my place would actually be in IT. So in that journey of switching over from science to IT, I was worried because, you know, I'd focused my entire career in one space. You know, how am I going to go over, even though I'd programmed before and IT is part of my research? And that was a similar question that I had from several hiring managers of, you don't have a single computer science class uh, listed. You don't have a computer science degree. You know, how do we actually expect you to be successful? And my response at that time was, well, if you look at my career to point this point in time, every few years I've had to learn new technologies. You know, I had to do deep dives into different areas to help out with different labs. And that shows that I am adaptable. I'd say additionally, I've also learned how to learn. So learned how to learn very quickly and take a very rigorous and analytic approach to my job. So that helps when we have to have a lot of precision in the way that we develop our work. And as I found, it also helped when I looked at software testing. I found a lot of parallels between my career in science and software testing. And that ended up being the focus area where I switched mainly from development space into the software testing realm because they, it scratched that same sort of itch that I had in science. And, you know, I've made this now my career focusing on this space. So the fundamental question that we ask, and I looked at a number of answers from uh, leaders in our industry is what is testing? James Box says questioning a product in order to evaluate it. Another one by one of the few professors of software testing out of University of Florida's Kem Kaner says empirical technical product investigation of the product done on behalf of stakeholders intended to reveal quality related information of the kind that they seek. No, this is definitely a, a professorial answer to it. My favorite answer is from Elizabeth Hendrickson, the author of Explore It on exploratory testing, designing an experiment to gather empirical evidence to answer a question about a risk. So we can start to see already some of the parallels between science and software testing, where ultimately we're seeking out knowledge. 
We want to have knowledge about our system or we want to have knowledge about the world. So testers and scientists often approach the, the uh, issue of knowledge in the same way of trying to understand things better and provide people information about that. So some of you out there may be hiring managers. I myself, you know, I'm a hiring manager. And when you're trying to find people, you may have a job description, but ultimately what it comes down to when you're talking to those people is like, what are the attributes that you actually look for? So if you've been on job interviews, what attributes do teams or managers look for in a good tester? So looking for some responses in the chat before we continue. So Kathy says, attention to detail. Jerome, high attention to detail, good communication skills. Kelly's clear, detailed, direct communication. What else do you look for if you were to hire a software tester? What's your ideal candidate? Patty says, thinking outside the box. Kelly, not afraid to speak up, inquisitive, curious, all great attributes. So the attributes that we look for in a good tester, you'll see a lot of your responses are actually shown here that you want someone who is analytical, you want someone that is technical, you want someone who is inquisitive, who's passionate, reflective, and communicative. If we were to look for the attributes of a scientist that make a good scientist, we would end up having the exact same list. So someone who is able to understand the system, both like white box style testing is an understanding how the system works, as well as black box, you know, looking at it from the perspective of the user, someone who is technical, someone who is inquisitive, who's not gonna just be satisfied with those so-called happy paths. And we also want someone who's able to reflect in sort of question those assumptions about what we're actually delivering. And I think most importantly of all, I think this is, applies for any role really, not just a scientist or testers, their ability to communicate their ideas back to the stakeholders or team members about the risks about the system, about what they learned. So we look for the same attributes in a good tester as well as a scientist. And there's a lot of linkages here. So William McConus for the Art of Science and Science Testing said close inspection will reveal that scientists approach and solve problems with imagination creativity, prior knowledge, and perseverance. Those same sort of approaches that we expect out of scientists are the same ones that we would hope to have in software testers of not just sticking to the acceptance criteria, but being creative, thinking in the same terms that a user would, or going through the same mistakes potentially that a user would to help understand our system and provide those risks back to the stakeholders. So one of the most common areas that we can use to sort of, you know, attach science back to software testing is in the scientific method. And this is a space where, for the most part, our education, at least primary education, has got it wrong in the way that they teach us about the scientific method. So what is the nexus between the two? Well, the nexus is science is about the pursuit of knowledge for knowledge's sake. Testing is about understanding the product and providing risks, providing knowledge back for it. If we were to go purely into like, what is technology then, you know, that is us using that knowledge from science and applying it for a commercial purpose. So they're still linked, it's about getting knowledge, but what the purpose is for that knowledge. For science, it's just learning for the sake of knowing more about our world. Whereas testing is about applying it about a product that we're releasing. So. When it comes to the scientific method, most of the ways that we learned about this in school is simply like, here is a checklist that you have to follow through, you know, or maybe you come up with a mission statement or a hypothesis and you generate a set of steps to test that and you have your results and you report it. 
Uh, that sort of step-by-step -step approach is actually not the way science is actually done from a research perspective. The reason why we learn it this way in school is that it's easier to have the step-by-step -step approach rather than say, the scientific method is actually a set of guidelines. The, the reason why you can sort of tell that the scientific method is not the step-by-step -step is think of all of the labs that end up having slightly different results or different approaches to tackling the same problem. And that is because there is no sort of cookbook for this. Generally, in the scientific method, we try to collect empirical evidence via observation. We propose a hypothesis, you know, a working understanding about how something uh, behaves in our world. And then we make predictions based upon that. Then we run tests or experiments to corroborate that hypothesis. You know, a core component of this is we're allowed to reject the hypothesis and we're actively looking for means to do so. So how does this apply to actual testers? Well, we try to learn the product and observe its behaviors. We identify risks and predict failures. And we execute tests to confirm those failures. So the process of the scientific method in terms of the guidelines we follow are the same set of general guidelines that we follow as software testers. Let's use a live example here. And since we're gonna refer, uh, since it's Pittsburgh Tech Fest, why not go with some hockey with the, the Pittsburgh Penguins and the Toronto Maple Leafs here. So the last time I gave this talk was uh, up in Toronto. So I, I pulled down the Maple Leafs fan app here. So what did they promise? Well, in this app, they say that we can follow the game live. We can preview upcoming games. We can get recaps from past games, receive score alerts, and interact with other fans. So in the chat, would some of you come up with areas that you would probe to confirm the behavior of this system? So just a few examples, please. So how would we test this Maple Leafs app? So as a fun aside, I, I mentioned to you that I, I worked as a baker and had that overlap this in my uh, career in IT. Uh, on my last trip to Canada, I forgot and left my baking knife in my glove compartment, which uh, the Border Patrol took as me trying to bring in a weapon. <laughs> I had to show them, I was like, no, this is purely for scoring bread. This is not for, for me to uh, commit any crimes with. Uh, but I did have to stop at the station for about an hour before they let me through. So how would we test this app if they promised these features? So Eric says, grab a group of people and do chats between two, three, five or more people. So let's go through the first one. Try and view games from, uh, from way in the past and the future. Jerome's getting a little bit ahead. So I, I like your thinking, Jerome. But to try to follow the game live, what we do. Yeah, have the game on your TV and watch it on the app. Linda, that's exactly right. Like we would want to try to confirm the happy path in this case. So if the game is actually live, can we follow it live on the app? What else can we do from those other four pieces of functionality that are promised? The previews of upcoming games, recaps from the past games. So we would expect to have from recaps, the actual accurate scores between the Penguins and the Maple Leafs for a past game. For Taylor, compare an official schedule with what the app shows for upcoming games. Yep, that's another great way to confirm. We go back to that live examples provide of, hey, when there is a goal scored in the live game that we should also receive that notification of a score. And then the other one of interacting with fans is great groups of two, three, or four, or five, just making sure that we can interact. So these are all great examples of us just confirming the application is behaving as expected. So thank you, everyone. However, we don't just stop there. 
So the happy path testing is probably one of the most sort of common forms of, of testing. It's just, here's a set of acceptance criteria. Do we meet it? Check, 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 check. However, checking is not like truly us taking the full form of testing. Uh, what we care about in science and as we should in software testing is falsifiable claims. It was originally generated by Karl Popper. William McComas has said science aims for falsifiable claims and not claims that cannot be verified. What that means is we have to confirm or prove a way that the ac actual system fails. You know, we have to put it to the test to make sure that it can reach that failure point. So another way of saying it in terms of software testing is testing can show the presence of errors, but not their absence. So if we think about it, like there are an infinite number of ways in which we can end up testing our systems, you know, but of course we're always gonna be limited by time and budget. So we cannot say that we have 100% test coverage in any sense of the, the word. What we can do is provide evidence about the system working and show that we have this amount of risk, but we can never say that something is truly completely tested. So we can never really confirm the absence of any defects. So if we wanted to go back and instead of just the happy path, we wanted to prove the system at its failure points. We want to falsify this same set of functionality for this app. How would we confirm failure points for this? The so-called unhappy path is what we're looking for. So how would you confirm in this case the follow the game live is not something that's necessarily going to be simulated, that we want to make sure that the system fails appropriately. That's exactly right, Taylor. We simulate a network or inter internet disruption. So is it still going to show the game is quote unquote being live if we've lost all network connectivity? You know, your Wi-Fi is out or cell tower is down. What about some of the other pieces of functionality that we would want to prove via falsification? I'm asking you all to think like testers here. How else would we go into this system and have it break down through falsification? Too many apps open, low memory is another. What else could we possibly approach this as? So right now we're focusing on like the network connectivity. That's great. Too many apps open. What sort of responses that we get if, you know, we cannot see upcoming games or games have been canceled. So that would be another is like, are we still going to see previews for upcoming games that are canceled? Say due to COVID. So we need ways in which we can simulate those circumstances as well. So what we equate that to and was often talked about is the difference between like happy path and unhappy path. But we want to be able to prove those failure points of the functionality we have in place. There's additional structure that we can put a place around software testing that will help aid us in our journey. One of those that we are familiar with in, soft, in uh, the software world is code reviews. So we have an expectation that developers, before they actually merge in their code, will go through the process of a code review, either with a peer sitting next to them or through a pull request uh, that has been made popular by uh, GitHub and uh, also in place in every single sort of source control management tool like Azure DevOps and GitLab. 
So peer review in science is a process used for checking the work performed by one's equals, peers, to ensure it meets specific criteria. So this is very common in the science world. Peer review is a process that can actually take years. So from the point at which you are ready to publish your work, it can go through a peer review process that involves a lot of back and forth. So even though you may have, say, finished back in 2018, you're just now getting a publication in 2021. We don't have that sort of acceptable lead time between our work being done and it being peer reviewed in IT. You know, we expect it to have a fast turnaround time. But where we can apply this from a code review perspective is we wanna have the same standards in place for peer review that we have in science that we do for code reviews for developers that we should have for testers. And the point being behind this is we're not just trying to answer questions as testers, we're trying to question answers. So we're looking at the premise in which we approached these problems and the premise in which the testers approached it. Are they purely going for that acceptance criteria or are they approaching problems from alternative means? So in this form, I like to also have not only like peer review by someone who's say on your same team, but also if we can between senior people and junior people on an, within an organization to help foster their professional growth. So we should have the expectation for a peer review in, in software testing the same way we would for science or for code reviews. Another approach that is valuable is using deduction. So in deduction, that's where you make a specific conclusion from general knowledge. We'll go through an example. I cannot see you in the room, but we can assume by like virtual show of hands, how many people are familiar with the Galaxy Note 7? Just checking virtually. Yeah, we got the hands up. Thank you, Kelly. And Paul as well. So the Galaxy Note 7 had an issue where if it overheated, the battery would expand and there was no room for that battery. And you would end up having your phone light on fire or blow up. So if I were to receive a brand new shiny Galaxy Note 7, I could reasonably come to the conclusion that it also will turn into a flaming brick. So that is making a specific conclusion from general knowledge. So the general knowledge we have is Galaxy Note 7 has a factory defect. So any new Galaxy Note 7 I have will also have that factory defect. An alternative form is when we make general conclusions from specific knowledge or induction. So if I were to say have an issue with Edge Browser, specifically the geolocation on Edge Browser, then I could extend that from a testing perspective to say, I'm gonna expect to have that same geolocation issue on Chrome and Firefox and the old IE and Safari. So that is us making a general conclusion from specific knowledge. In this case, I have one instance that I have available to me and I can apply it to others and I'm going to test my premise in this situation. Additionally, we have at our fingertips exploratory testing, which at this point in time has been around for more than a decade and has been weighed in by numerous experts in the field. Uh, I would say that in today's world, uh, those folks who are, were behind it, and this is like Michael Bolton and James Bach, will just call it testing rather than exploratory testing. But there is a concept that was introduced years ago by James Bach called session-based test management. So what is exploratory testing? James Bach says it's simultaneous learning, test design, and test execution. It follows the same sort of general flow that we would expect from the scientific method where we learn, we design our tests, we execute that test, and our feedback will help us inform the direction we're going for our next test. So we interact with that system, designing and executing tests in rapid succession. The results from our prior test lead to our next test, and it's an adaptive approach. So the structured approach is, here's our set of 10 test cases, here's our criteria, and we're gonna test each one. Whereas 
it's more of a game of 20 questions when you're doing exploratory testing where where you're informed from the prior question is going to potentially change your direction for the next one. This is a way for us to test the capabilities and limitations of the software that wouldn't necessarily be considered with the traditional acceptance criteria. So here's some core differences, because on one end of the spectrum where we have like completely open ended with exploratory, on the other, we have what most people are familiar with, like test automation. So exploratory is individual based versus scripted, which are requirements based. Exploratory is something you do in the moment versus in advance for scripted. Exploratory is about investigation, whereas scripted is more about confirmation, those checks. You know, did we verify the system behaved as expected? Exploratory is adaptable, whereas scripted is supposed to be predictable. We're expecting the same results every time we execute those scripted tests. Exploratory is about learning, where scripted is decided. We're just, we already decided on what our behavior should be. So it actually exists on a spectrum. And I think this is in another important point when we say we want to take a scientific approach to software testing. Just like in science, that you may have some set procedures for setting up of your samples or reproduction of your results, it is also open-ended in terms of how you learn and adapt and approach problems. It doesn't mean that necessarily one is better than other, it's that in order to be more complete in your approach to software testing, you need to have both represented. You need to have those quick automated checks in place, things like unit tests, integration tests, functional automated tests, as well as exploration in your software testing to find the things that you may not have considered that would have potentially not even been part of those acceptance criteria, but are unexpected uh, behaviors of your system. Because I can guarantee you this, that you may not have found it with your small group, you know, development team working on it, but if you're going to send it off to thousands or millions of users, it's more than likely that someone will end up finding that unexplained behavior. And even if it's a small percentage of your user base, that can lead to potential problems. So in session-based test management, it's a way for us to attach the sort of rigor that we would expect to that open-ended, so that way we can provide evidence of our activities. So James Box says, we wanna be accountable for our work, give a status report that reflects what we actually did and provide a detailed map of our travels. So this is how we go from being open-ended to providing some additional information that can help inform the team and the organization. So the core components of SBTM is a charter, sort of where you're beginning to focus, the time box for your session, every SBTM session is time boxed, a reviewable result, as well as a debriefing. So your charter is that clear mission for the session where you're going to test the geolocation functionality for your store locator. That is your charter. Another way that you can focus on this is using a template. So I'm going to explore some target with these resources at my disposal to discover some information. The target is what exactly are you exploring? The resources is what supplies will you bring? The information is what are you hoping to find? You wanna focus your test effort on a fixed duration. So this is what time box, 30 minutes, one hour, similar to the ceremonies that we have in a lot of the various uh, flavors of Agile that have been implemented. You wanna time box these sessions. So the sessions should be brief enough for accurate reporting, flexible scheduling to allow for course correction during that session, but long enough so that way you get actual solid testing done. If half of your session is spent doing setup, getting access to the data you need, getting your tools ready, and only half of it's spent on actual testing, then potentially it needs to be longer. You also wanna have efficient debriefings. So that part of that peer review that I mentioned. The reviewable results is a scannable session sheet. Within most testing tools that are associated with project tracking, uh, you have exploratory testing as a core component of there. So you can actually look, say for instance, on JIRA, they have an extension for Zephyr that in Zephyr will have exploratory testing built in. So that scannable session sheet will include your charter, your start time, who are the testers, the breakdown of your activities, 
any data files that you referenced, those testing notes, bugs that you discovered, potential curious issues that, that you found. So this can be done in a simple Word doc, or it can be done with those available testing tools. And this way you can have it integrated in with the rest of your project work that will indicate your evidence that, of testing activities, which are quite useful if you have to go through compliance, either internal or external to prove your testing activities. So here's an example sheet that's just in a Word doc where you're gonna list your start time, end time, who's testing, what are your focus areas, and what are the interesting things that you found. So there are a number of templates available out there for you. But it's important that when you're going through that debrief that, all right, your measurement will begin with some form of observation. You're going to, in that session, review for understanding. Did you understand how the system behaves? Can you answer any questions during that debrief session about your activities? Are you going to check against any session metrics? And as we accrue more of these sessions, they aggregate into an overall listing that will provide us some valuable insights into the state of our application as well as own testing activities. During that session, you can change the charter. You can make an adjustment or you can generate new charters from it. You can even decide to simply extend that session. So you have all these available options to you. So even though we're adding some structure to exploratory testing, we're not like completely removing it and having it cease to be something that's open-ended. What we wanna do is provide enough structure in place so that way we can use those insights and provide them to the rest of the team. This is also an opportunity for coaching. As I mentioned, like we wanna be able to have the senior people, the people who have a great deal of wisdom or system knowledge, work with some of the junior people. So that way we have that transfer and we maintain that sort of organizational knowledge. So in a debriefing, here's a sample set of questions that James Bach could come up with, but ultimately like your team could decide on a separate set of questions about, you know, what is our focus area for charters? What did we find out from testing or bugs that were potentially out there? What data files did we need? I'd say some of the insights that you can provide from this is, if we're spending most of our time doing setup, that's a good indication that we have not sort of armed our testers or team members with the tools to do their job. Uh, if we sort of lack knowledge in terms of how the system behaves from a, a white box perspective, then that's a good indication that we also need to have our development team members or architects, you know, work with the rest of the team to help provide them insights on how the system uh, is put together. Providing those insights will allow our testers to explore more deeply. One of the positive benefits from this is you can generate metrics that you can use across multiple sessions. You know, by taking, say, the number of sessions completed, you can also look at the number of problems found. So we can see, are we providing some value through these sessions by finding problems given the time? You know, what are the functional areas that we cover from our application? We know that we cannot completely test our application. However, we can at least look at the functional areas of our application to provide some insights. We're gonna look at the percentage of sess and time that we say spent setting up. Actual testing and investigating those problems. I think if you go through or if you have already with your teams, you'll find out something that's quite shocking. When I first started doing SBTM and expanded it to my entire business segment years ago, I found that most of the testers were actually not spending time testing the application. They were working on administrative tasks. Uh, they were doing a lot of setup just to make sure that their system is right, making sure that the environment was in the right position, as in like the developer set things up for them to test in a lower environment before they actually got to the confirmation. A small fraction of their time was actually spent testing the application itself. So insights like these can help lead to process change within your organization. You may have something underlying that undercuts your testing activities that you can address through these metrics. The last area that I wanna to touch on today is what's known as hypothesis-driven development. So it's a new way in which we can approach the work that we're doing as an entire team that changes how we think about testing. So Barry O'Reilly says that hypothesis-driven development is thinking about the development of new ideas, products, and services, even organizational change, as a series of experiments to determine whether an expected outcome will be achieved. So the key outcome of an experimental approach is having that measurable evidence and learning. 
So going back to the definition of science, science is knowledge. It's the pursuit of knowledge for knowledge's sake. What we want to do is have empirical evidence in place so that way we can make a good decision about is this feature actually providing value to our users or not? So in HDD, you make observations, often about the marketplace, trends in the industry. You formulate a hypothesis and you design an experiment to test that hypothesis. You have to have indicators to evaluate if your experiment has succeeded. Going back to that principle of falsifiability, we have to be able to reject our hypothesis for it to be a true experiment. Otherwise, we're just practicing a form of pseudoscience. We then conduct the experiment. We evaluate the results and accept or reject the hypothesis. So if necessary, we can modify and test a new hypothesis. So as a quick check for everyone, what sort of form of popular testing is in place that uses HD, HDD? Used primarily by retailers. There's a couple of names for it. If you work for a retailer, you likely practice this form of HDD. Secret shoppers? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that. I'm thinking like purely in terms of uh, software. Let's also give a few hints like Google and Amazon have thousands of these in place at any one given time. For Jerome, Jerome got it. A-B testing or split testing. And, and I'll provide an example later. So that's a form of HDD because we ultimately can falsify one of those uh, views you know, or experiences that users would go and roll that back. And this is where you have run up to some of the problems with HDD is that there's an investment that people have, specifically people funding a project or funding an initiative that they don't like the idea necessarily of this feature didn't receive the sort of response that we wanted from our user base. We're going to roll it back. They want everything to be a success once we get started. So HDD has a general template that follows. We believe this capability will result in this outcome. We will have confidence to proceed when we see a measurable signal. That is to say, you define a test capability of the product to be built, which will determine the functionality and your hypothesis to test. The outcome is the expected outcome of the experiment. And your measurable signal is your criteria to reject the hypothesis. It has to have some empirical form that we could say, no, this did not succeed. We're going to roll this back. The fundamental change that occurs to testers is shifting our mindset from testing features of a product to whether or not users actually want the feature. Uh, with an old school sort of like quality approach to testing, that addresses the sort of quality gaps. So the idea behind this is, as a producer, we care about a different set of criteria than our customers do. We care about meeting the requirements of our system, building the right thing, building it the right way, and absolutely being on time and on budget. The customers, though, they don't necessarily care about like meeting the requirements. They care that it's just fit for their use. It's the right product for them. It meets their needs, and they're actually treated well by it. So what we set out to do as a producer and what we actually put out there is a gap. What the customers expect from us and what they actually get is also a gap. So our goal is to try to close those feature gaps. And by taking the approach of looking at it from the user's perspective and everything we do as an experiment is one of the means in which we can achieve that. So I'll, I'll take this all the way back. You know, I was a scientist, a software tester, uh, but also a baker. So I'm going to go back to my time working for Panera. So we believe that increasing the size of niche images on the My Panera registration page will result in improved customer conversion. We will have confidence to proceed when we see a 10% increase in customers completing My Panera registration over the registration page with the original niche images. So important to get customers to sign up for loyalty programs. We want that 10% increase with a 
larger, more delicious image of a niche. So if we go through A, B, or split testing for this, where we're going to send half of our customers to the original page, and we're going to redirect the other half to the new page with the larger, more delicious looking niche. And in this result, we find out that 36% of users who are sent in one direction will actually sign up with the original, compared to 51% signing up under the new delicious niche image. So in this case, we wanted to look for a 10% increase. That was our point at which we would reject it. So if it was less than 46%, we would end up rejecting that. And who wouldn't be encouraged to register when they're looking at something as delicious as this? So that's how you can use hypothesis-driven development is you can go through a number of experiments and based upon those experiments, you either leave in place the functionality you built or you roll it back because the customers aren't enjoying it or some other metric that you have that can be due to just purely revenue or just simply usage on that application. But the point being is you're making an empirical decision, not one that's driven by, I just funded this and I wanna see it as a pet project. So let me go look into our last question on there, right? To finish up for today, we found that science and software testing share parallels in both the observation and experimentation. Scientists are very much like software testers and vice versa. What we can do is apply some of the rigors of science to help understand and inform software testers, both testers and outsiders. We want to make sure that testers are viewed up in sort of that same lofty space as scientists are, that testing is seen as something that is more valuable rather than just simply a checkbox that we wanna to meet to push a feature out there. So adopting those rigors will help testers improve the current activities as well as how they're viewed within the team and their organization. So thank you very much for your time today. If you wanna to reach out to me, there's my email, there's my Twitter, and there's my uh, tech blog on automation and DevOps, Red Green Refactor. Thank you very much for your time. I'll be open to additional questions here. Thank you so much, Thomas, and thanks everyone for being here. I'm gonna give a few minutes for questions to come in the chat. Before you go, I wanna remind you that from 10 to 10.30 today, please join our attendees and sponsors in the networking session. You will go into small breakout rooms and then after the 15 minute mark, you'll be switched into a new room. Um, everything that you'll need to know to get into that session is available in SCED. But for now, let's see any questions. And if not, I see Thomas has generously offered every single way to contact him, which we appreciate. So you can feel free to reach out directly. We'll give you a couple more seconds here. And if not, we'll give you a little bit of time back. Thank you much, Eric. Thanks for, for joining. Thank you much, Taylor. Appreciate it. Okay, so we do have a question. How do uh, session-based test management and automated testing play together? So if we go back, it's on two different ends of that spectrum of, of testing where scripting and another is open-ended. So exploratory testing will provide you insights. And I think even Eric mentioned in there, I saw monitoring some of his chat is, will help you find a lot of clusters of bugs or things that are not something that you set. So, I mean, that's one of the core components. Like when I say something that you set is, for automated testing, it's supposed to do the same exact thing when you execute it over and over again. It's looking at a specific set of criteria that you have already put in place. Exploratory is about finding those gaps, those things that you didn't necessarily think of, ways in which the system behaves that your automated tests are not checking for. And this is why they both provide value because you're never gonna be able to completely test anything, but you do want to provide those insights, that information about your system behavior. So having both sides of the spectrum represented will provide a more overall complete picture of your actual system that you're testing. So the SBTM component of exploratory testing is a way for you to convey that information to the rest of the team or the rest of the organization in that sort of like structured approach after the fact. 
So it can help provide insights so you can make better decisions going forward. Like I mentioned, if you find that most of your time in testing is spent like just simply doing setup and administrative tasks, that I would say is a big sort of smell for how your organization is approaching testing is you should be actually testing the application during that time. Thank you very much, Thomas. I don't see any other questions, so I think we can end this, but I hope to see everyone in the networking session coming up at 10. Thanks, Art. I, I appreciate it. It's been a while since I've been uh, to Pittsburgh, and thank you, Allison, and the rest of the group for uh, having me visit and talk. I appreciate it. And Paul, the last thing before we like finish off, it's not necessarily like exploratory testers and regular testers. Think of it more of like this is should be in your toolbox as an individual that like I as a person who like sort of make my bones with test automation, uh, push, you know, exploratory testing in this fashion and others in the same place like Elizabeth Hendrickson, who I, I mentioned, you know, uh, she is a programmer. You know, she takes a very scientific approach to testing, but she published the book on Explore It. A exploratory testing. And I'd recommend if you want to learn more about exploratory testing, that you actually just uh, go buy her book, Explore It. That will provide you a great deal of insight. So look at it just in terms of the toolbox that a tester can use. And my hat does indeed have Ohio on it. So uh, it's called Explore It is the name of the book. It's by Elizabeth Hendrickson. So it's available on Pragmatic Programmer. I get no money from this. I'm just recommending it as a good book. So you can buy the digital version uh, quite easy. I'll say IO for the people in the chat. I'm make, making any Penn State grads in the, in the chat angry. Sorry about that. Looking forward to playing, playing you guys later this year. Here for a good time and some solid football rival rivalry. So no hard feelings, Thomas. But thank you for being here. Thank you everyone for joining us back at day two of TechFest. And we'll see you soon for networking and more breakouts at 11. Right. Take care. Thank you everyone.